Hey guys, it's Max Kavexti here. Hope everyone's having a great day. Um, yeah, I think it might rain here in Austin, and I just gave Jackson a bully stick, so I have a few minutes to try to get this presentation in. I have a good video planned out for you guys today called Max Addresses the Sustainability of Covered Call Funds. The subtitle is, Hey Max, am I going to lose my shirt? I sure hope not, and I don't think so. But let's talk about it, and let's, uh, let's get in the middle of it and see what we got, okay? We'll figure it out together. Thank you very much. All right. So this video started off as a video on... QQQI, which is a new little brother to SpyEye, which is a cool fund and it has a lot of good features, and I'm excited about excited about presenting that video also. But then yesterday, whenever the big blow up happened with IWMY paying, uh, you know, paying more than they earned, or I guess not earning anything and paying something, um, then I I got a bunch of comments that were you know hesitant and negative, and I understand that, and so I spent all day trying to deal with the comments and, and all that kind of stuff and uh, just talking to people. But so then as I, but then this morning I got up and tried to continue on the QQQI video, but then I just kept thinking about other stuff. So this video kind of, the QQQI video kind of evolved or devolved, however you want to look at it, into a uh, video on what I'm doing now. Um, and the reason, the reason I mentioned that is because when I was making the QQQI video, it occurred to me there's two main business models in the covered call space. Um, and QQQI is part of Group A. And Group A is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But there's either funds that go public at 50. You know, they trade around 50, 55, whatever, like, like the JP Morgan funds. QILD, I believe, is the same way. But they... they they cost 50 and then they give you a 50 cent dividend and that's really good easy math because it's a 1% dividend. So that equals 12% a year. And that's kind of I think the benchmark that JP Morgan and QILD and all those different funds try to achieve. So that would be group A and that's the way they organize their business and you know it's like Adriano said, uh, I forget the name of his channel, maybe Passive Income Investing, but and he's great. But he was saying the main difference in these funds is the pay schedule, is how they pay. And, you know, and that, that's true. So Group A has a, they're, they're going to give you 50 cents, and they're going to charge you $50 for the fund. Okay. And that's fine. Um, group B, on the other hand, starts at 20. This is the new group, the Johnny Come Latelys. They usually go public at 20, and they pay everything they can afford to. And so I'm thinking of Yield Max and Defiance. But also, I believe FEPI would fall into that category. FEPI would fall into that category. And so would the Curve single stock funds would fall into the Group B category, I believe. These aren't hard and fast rules, but it just got me thinking. But So then from business model, the way my mind works is I started thinking, okay, well, I started thinking back to the commenters I have yesterday, and I do have the best commenters. Uh, I'd like to especially thank Thomas and Norman. Um, I, I had some long exchanges with them yesterday. We went back and forth on different things, and th those guys really keep me sharp, and they're good at uh, they're good at mentioning the other side of the story, and I really appreciate those guys, and so those guys kind of inspired this video also. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Norman. There's plenty of others, too. But especially I was thinking of them. And the reason I was thinking of them is because I was thinking, okay, I'm always, you know, Thomas and Norman and I are going back and forth and back and forth. And I'm always saying these things are sustainable. And they're, and I think they're in the camp of the unsustainable. That's fine. But, and I think I know where maybe part of the disagreement's coming from. When I'm saying sustainable, lots of times I'm talking about the strategy because I'm just so focused on, selling options and gathering premium and all that kind of good stuff that I'm just hyper focused on that and sometimes I can't see the forest for the trees and that's where it comes into the business model these 
funds don't sell premium in a, in a vacuum. They also exist within a business model. And that's kind of what Adriano was mentioning with the, um, these funds have the, the main difference they have is the pay schedule. I guess it is raining here because Jax is soaking wet. Let me uh, scoot over here. All right. Thanks for your patience, you guys. Um, so I think Thomas and, and, and Norman and I are, you know, just talking about different things in a lot of cases. Yes, the business models are, are totally different than the strategies. The strategies are highly sustainable, in my opinion. So I decided to try to quantify it. I like numbers and, and things, and so this number is based on my opinion, but I'm still, it, I still want to put a number to it. So I made what's called the Max Convexity Sustainability Score. You've heard of ESG. It's real controversial politically-wise and stuff. ESG funds are, and ESG, ESG itself is a real hot-bun issue that we aren't even going to get into here. I, I don't even want to talk. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. But I, I mean, these other, these uh, high yield funds are controversial enough. I don't want to get any more controversial than them. That this is enough excitement in my life. So what I came up with was the uh, is the Max Convexity Sustainability Score. We'll call it MSG. Okay, yeah, that's kind of funny because you know, like MSG. So MSG is made up of two components. Um, I made it up of uh, of the strategy component and also of the business model component. So let's start with the strategy component. And this is what sometimes I probably have a hard time seeing the forest for the trees because I'm just so hyper-focused on the strategy and, and how cool they are. You know, especially these one-day put selling strategies are, are just awesome in my opinion. So I'm going to give a score of 95 to on a strategy basis to these funds. JEPQ, JEPI, JEPY, QQQI, IWMY, iSpy, SPY I, QILG, not QILD, QILG, there's a difference, XYLG, YMAG, and YMAX. The reason those guys get the top ranking, you know, the 95 score, these strategies are accretive. They, they you know, the, everyone's worried about these funds decaying and stuff. Well, I'm worried about them decaying from a strategic standpoint when they run decaying strategies like, you know, CYA, TA. I L U V X Y, even though there's a place for those strategies, those don't mean those funds are just bad and unredeemable, but you know, they're definitely decayers. These strategies are accretive. They, they, they make money hand over fist. That's why, that's what my whole channel's about. I, I track it on a daily basis. Um, you know, that's pretty much what the daily updates are for is to show people how powerful these daily option strategies that defiance does. Or I really don't enjoy doing spreadsheets every day, but I do enjoy talking about options. So it's a it's a mixed bag. It gives me a chance uh, to talk about options. So so those guys get a ninety five. They they run totally accretive strategies that are they're long term winners. You know I've always mentioned this example. Warren Buffett does this. Insurance companies do this. They're they're good strategies. All right, all right. Well, then I'm going to give, on a strategic basis, I'm going to give a 90 to Global X, and I'm going to give to the Global X the main funds, the QYLD and XYLD. Even though those strategies are accretive, they use at-the-money options, and I've talked numerous times about that. Jax has got himself tangled up now. It's not going to be long before he barks. But they run, um, you know, those, the strategies are accretive, but they, they don't get any upside because they use the at-the-money the reason these other funds got a 95 is they use out of the money plus accretive strategies. The reason X, QYLG and XYLG also got a 95 is even though they use at the money strategies, they only sell half the amount of calls they could. Half of their shares are straight long and unencumbered by option strategies. So they're, they can appreciate as much as they're able to. So I'm using that to offset that. And I, so those Global X funds get the 95. Those are really good funds. All right, so 90 is still good, but you would definitely, I would definitely put QILD and XYLD in those, you know, in, in that thing. Then on 85, I would give an 85 to the yield max and curve stocks. And I don't, I don't dislike them or anything, 
because they're single stocks, they have idiosyncratic risk, a, a lot more risk than an index does by a, by a pretty huge factor. You can't say with any, you could pretty much say there's a 0% chance of an index going belly up. But there's not a non-zero chance of, of a stock going belly up. I mean, it can happen. I mean, you know, there, there can be malfeasance like there was with um, malfeasance, however you say that word, like there was with Enron. Um, but there can, and there can also just be changes in market and stuff. And I'm talking over a long time frame. None of these stocks are going anywhere tomorrow, but I'm looking out with my numbers. I'm looking, I'm trying to pay attention on a 10 year horizon. All right. But yeah, yield max and curve because they're single stocks. I knocked five more points off them. So we'll call them an 85. They still have accretive strategies, you know, nothing wrong with them. And then I didn't even know where to rank these other ones. I thought about ranking them a zero because these other ones are proven decayers. They will decay. They will erode. Your, you know, your balance will, they will continually split it. And they'll, they'll, these ones down here, CYA and TAIL, UVXY, they will go to zero and continuously split and do what everyone is afraid that, um, that Tesla is going to do, but it won't. All right. So look at... Um, so let's look at TRES. Now, TRES, there's a big question mark. That's to be determined because their strategy is so new and they, and they left the prospectus open to any kind of strategy. But we're just going to start with the baseline of their on the strategy component of the, of the score. Now, there's also a business model component. I, I was very creative and named it the MSGBM. Uh, all right, but on the business model component, we're going to have to put in, this is more what Norman I believe, I'm not trying to put words in their mouth, but uh, Norman, this is more what he is into, uh, is, the, is the business model thing of it, the sustainability from a, hey, they're paying, they're paying income that they haven't made yet, you know, and I totally get that. Uh, I mean, I, I totally get his point. So, and I, and I factored that into my decision. So the funds that are in Group A, like we talked about earlier, and they don't pay everything out, they give targeted income. That would be like Spy High and J.P. Morgan and Global X. Business model-wise, yeah, they they get a 95. They they got it going on business-wise. And you would just to be fair, even as much as I love Yield Max and Defiance, because they just pay out everything. Even though the investor is free to reinvest some of the money back into it and everything, but still, a lot of people don't do that. So you're going to definitely put defiance. I'm going to put defiance in your max at an 85. Um, and so then to get the composite ranking, the MSGC, we're just going to combine the two of them. All right. So the overall rank, you know, J.P. Morgan, Spy Eye, and I'm sure I'm missing ones, but you guys can tell my methodology. You know, those types of funds, 95, overall ranking. So I'm saying you look out over the 10-year horizon, in my opinion, based on my experience and based on everything and based on my conversations with Norman and, and others, um, I say these funds have a 95% chance of being here 10 years from now. Okay, so that's J.P. Morgan Spy Eye. All right, then so Global X. <clears throat> They're fine, too, because they retain a lot of the earnings. They do a lot of smart stuff, but they get hurt because they use the at-the-money strategy. So their composite ranking is only 92.5, but still a 92.5% chance, that's, that's very good. I mean, Global X has already been here since 2016. I mean, they're, you know, they're pretty good, um, other than the at-the-money strategy. All right, so then uh, Yield Max, y, Yield Max, and Defiance, and I'm going to throw Y Mag in with this one. They get a composite MSG of 90. You know, but I will give, I will, uh, you know, Norman and Rock. Nor, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Mark and Norman. You guys are right. There are, there are issues with these. There are things that we need to talk about. I'm just trying to give us a framework to talk about this. But yes. Business model-wise, it hurts them because they pay out all the dividends. Some people aren't disciplined enough to reinvest, and I get that. And then I'm going to give the, the single stocks an 85 composite, and I just did that by, you know, averaging the other two things. And like I say, I don't, I don't hate them, but I'm saying there's an 85% chance that Tesla's around 10 years from now. There's a 90% chance that YMAG is around, you know, uh, 10 years from now. There's a 92.5% chance 
the global X is around, and then there's a 95% chance. So I just want to give us a framework to try to talk about these. But yes, you, I have to live in reality. The business model is not as good on defiance and yield max. It, it, it just isn't, you know, it just isn't. And you guys convinced me. All right, so what I was going to say next, I tried to be consistent. Uh, the first two weeks I was on this channel, uh, I was a little bit fired up on QQQI. A lot of you guys probably weren't even watch, watch me then. But then as I learned and as I read comments, I bet you anything, those comments were also from Mark and uh, were Mark and Norman. But I, I started to get comments like two weeks in and people were saying, you know, yeah, I like your channel and stuff, but hey, for my money, JP Morgan's just better and more stable. And so I reevaluated it and I did the channel echo chamber. I did the show echo chambers and um, confirmation bias. And that was one of my best videos ever. And definitely one of my more honest videos. And yeah, I came out, you know, and I've been, I've been on YouTube about two weeks and I said, yeah, you guys are right. Upon further studying, JP Morgan is the gold standard of covered call funds. And I've been consistent with that ever since then. And and you know, especially when you factor in other things like expense ratio, and I'm not even talking about expense ratio today, but, you know, but even more so when you think about stuff like that. So, but I mean, honestly, I don't think any of these are going to blow up. Not the Global X, not Defiance, not Yield Max. I, I honestly don't think that. I'm not blowing smoke. You know, um, I'm really am trying to build a brand based on trust and knowledge, but also neutrality or objectivity. Um, so, uh, Whenever I catch myself being non-neutral or non-objective, I'll darn sure come on the channel and talk about it. I mean, the main reason I'm here is because I like an excuse to talk about option trading. I'm an option fanboy. But these ETFs give me a framework from within to, to talk about them. But, of course, I don't want to be associated with something that crashes and burns. I mean, my gosh, if I get any inclination that, that you know, something's not like I think it is, or if I'm, if you guys teach me something else or whatever, I would be off defiance like that. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't care. It's not that big of a deal to me. My, my reputation and, and, you know, what you guys think of me is a bigger deal. I, I do read my comments and I, you know, I, uh, I'm a people pleaser. I've always been. At the same time, I have to be honest and tell you what I really think, but, but I'm very open to, I'm very open to the fact that I might not be I'll always be right. Um, so speaking of that, what could I see that would change my opinion on defiance? All right. If they started paying more than 90% of the extrinsic, if they were giving 150% of the extrinsic, or if they were giving, if they started paying out triple what they earned every month or something, then I would agree that that's not sustainable. Um, and I would have to reevaluate. You know, but I've also, speaking of consistency, I think on my first or second video, I said, I really like these funds. Once I realized how that they're, once I realized that NAV depletion was going to be part of the game, but but that they made more, you know, you made more on the dividend than on the depletion, then I, I, I used this word. I said, these are, they're changing the way people retire, and you can annuitize your retirement. You know, in other words, it's like being in an annuity, but annuities are boring. This is a way you can be in the market, kind of. And, you know, and annuitize your retirement. I've been consistent about that also. Yesterday, um, when I made the insurance analogy, I think uh, a lot of people, or a few people, I got some comments on that, you know, hey, this isn't an insurance company, Max. Okay, but I made it for a reason. The, the, the analogy, and I stand by it. In the same way that an insurance company doesn't go broke every time Florida has a hurricane. They have a short-term loss. When Florida has a hurricane, they have to pay out more in claims than they're making in their investment income that month or that six months. But they're looking at over a five-year, over a 10-year period. That's what, that's what the actuaries do. You know, that's the same thing these guys are doing when they're giving us 90% of the extrinsic. Yeah, they're paying us out of future profits. Okay. I mean, yeah, call it what it is. But um, like I say, it's, it's not like these funds aren't going to have hella future profits. These, you, like I always show you, there's a huge edge when you do this strategy. And from a strategic standpoint, they're all very solid, especially the index ones. So I don't have a problem with it. Other people do, and, and that's fine. You, I also made the analogy, and I stand by this, the guy that, you know, buys his, 
he buys insurance, then the next day he has a heart attack. Okay, well, you know, but they still pay his widow a million dollars. So the insurance company paid out of future profits to the widow. They didn't make it on him. The insurance company is not looking at just this one guy. They're looking at all 100,000 people they insure. This fund, Jay and them aren't looking at just this month. They're looking at every month, and they're paying us out of future earnings. Like I say, I don't have a problem with that. I think the 90% of extrinsic is sustainable. But I will keep trying to find ways to further quantify that. I'm going to try to find a, a better way to prove it to you. But that's just uh, my feeling. Um, so also, I want to promise I'm not sponsored by Defiance. I probably should be. I mean, but I wouldn't do that. I mean, I, I want to have my own opinion and stuff. But I mean, it, I know it probably seems like I do. But I'll, I'll flip on them in a, in a second, you know, if, if, if I saw something change. I think they're solid, but I'm, I'd be anxious to hear what you guys think. Um, I do believe that they're, of course, and that's why I had to put this number to it. Okay, Defiance is a 90 and J.P. Morgan's a 95. Okay, I have to be honest. Uh, and if you if you would have different rankings and evaluate it different, put it in the comments and let me know. I, I'm just telling you, that's my feeling. So in my opinion, the five points of ec extra risk is more than offset by the extra reward. All right, but to be, now, I want to even be more fair to the naysayers. Um, you know, it's not just Norman and, and uh, Mark. They're probably my two most articulate naysayers, but I, I have lots of them. Um, I tried to put my dad in these funds. Even before I got on YouTube, I was so excited and so fired up. I wrote him a white paper and my two brother-in-laws, basically like a, a white paper, a white-ish paper, and I explained to the to the nth detail, you know, how these worked and blah, 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 and, and why they were good and what the detractors were saying and why it wasn't true. Basically, that white paper was what started my channel. I ought to publish the white paper on my channel sometime and let you guys read it. I wrote it like after I'd known about these funds for two days, and everything I said is still true and has come true. I was right on base. I didn't, I don't think I made any I said they were closed-in funds, and that wasn't true. I thought they were at first. But anyway, other than that, everything has, has borne out in reality. But yes, it was kind of depressing not to be able to put my dad in it. My dad, uh, he's just not interested. It looks too good to be true. I get that. I mean, he's my own father. He loves me. Thinks I'm a great guy, but it just, you know, I, I can't make the sale to him. I mean, you know, my dad taught me everything I know about options, so that's why it particularly hurt with him, or I thought that he would be the most susceptible because I, I always remember the day in 1987 when he came home from work and he told me that he was going to start selling puts instead of doing covered calls. And I thought, well, yeah, that's all right. But if you're short a put and the stock goes to zero, you lose all that money. You know, it's too much risk. He said, well, what happens if you when you're doing a covered call on the same stock and it goes to zero? It's the same risk. And like I always tell you guys, it took me like five minutes to wrap my head around it. But it is. It's, it's no different. And it's more, also it's more efficient with capital because you don't have to pony up the money off, up, off the bat. You can keep your capital. You just have to be prepared to spend it. So anyway, I've been, you know, high on covered calls and short puts ever since that day in 1987. So that's why when this fund came out, my dad was the first one I thought about. He's, he's an investor and he loves total return. I think he has a bunch of, or he has some, some VU and some SPY, and he likes that kind of stuff. He likes diversity. He's basically like a growing-up version of me, or like a wealthier version of me, let's just say. But um, I thought he would be all over this. But no, and, <laughs> no, no can do. My uh, two brother-in-laws are both really sharp also. My one brother-in-law was actually a financial planner for a few years out of college and uh, knows all about options. But he ended up following his dream, and he became a, I love to tell this story, he became a golf coach. He's a, he was a collegiate golfer. Um, and he became a golf coach for a Division I university. And they won a national championship. He, and, and he also, before that job, he was a golf coach at a Division II a, at a smaller school. And they won a national championship, too. He's a two-time national champion golf coach. And he started off in the financial industry. But he's just a follow-your-dream kind of guy. Anyway, he knows a lot about investing. He wasn't interested, not even at all. I mean, you know, and, <laughs> and then I have another brother-in-law who's a doctor, and he's a very accomplished investor. He's married to my sister, and uh, my sister and I sold a lot of covered calls in the 90s, 
and he was married to her in the 90s, so he did too. He's very, they're very attuned to how it works and everything, but they just aren't interested in it. It, it. I get that it sounds too good to be true, and I get that these are a hard sell. So I, I don't get upset whenever I get comments from naysayers. It just, you know, you guys remind me of my dad, basically. Um, all right, so yesterday I was, when I was trying to explain how they pay us some of the, they pay, they're paying us in advance on IWMY. They're giving us future earnings. And I was trying to think of other ways to explain it besides, uh, besides the insurance analogy. And I talked about in the finance industry, the entire finance industry is run on future value calculations. That's how they do annuities. It's how they do insurance. It's how they do everything. The whole industry is run on that. So to be fair, though, it's not like those models never blow up. Does anyone remember long-term capital? I think it was 1998. I remember it. Um, they were, I think they were selling options. I, I forget the exact strategy and what they had done. I, I had heard in later years is they did not, they did not, uh, respect the risk from a tell event enough. And they ended up blowing up and they had, I think they had like a Nobel prize winning, uh, they had Nobel prize winning economist as part of the, you know, they were blue blood as you get sharp guys and they blew up. So it's not like future value calculations can never go awry. I, I don't know. Maybe Jay and these guys at Defiance are off. I really don't know. I don't think so. But I mean, just to be honest, it, that is true. That is a thing that can happen. So another way I think of these funds, I like analogies. This fund could be thought of as like if you buy a Ferrari. Well, I had a friend that looked into getting a Ferrari. And the reason he decided not to is because he, he, he could afford the Ferrari. He probably afford anything he wanted, but he didn't want to, this is when I lived in Oklahoma, he would have had to take the Ferrari to Dallas to get an oil change and it would have cost like $6,000. The upkeep was way too much. It'd be like having a boat. If you ever price boats, a, a boat itself isn't that expensive, but the upkeep on a boat plus the insurance and the slip, I mean, sure, that's, you know, that's what I think these funds are like. They're, and especially because of the fact that you really have to be dedicated enough to put two-thirds of the premium back into the fund. So it's definitely not for everybody. Um, you know, I also compared it maybe to having a younger wife or a lake house. I mean, it's stuff that's that's fun, but you don't have to have. And and it's going to be extra upkeep. And I, and I get that. So I'm just trying to be fair to the naysayers. Okay, but on the other hand, though, these aren't, but I'm still going to stand by, these aren't a Ponzi scheme. I got a comment or two yesterday that said they're paying money they don't have. This is a Ponzi scheme. And I would, I would definitely push back on that. You know, of course, a Ponzi scheme is, I know you guys all know this, but a Ponzi scheme is when a business doesn't have a business model. They don't have a way to make profit. They just, they just need somebody to come along and, and you know, that's the greater fool theory or the, the sucker born every minute theory. Um, and that's not like these are. These, you know, there's, there's history going back to 87 that the CBOE, the Chicago Board of Options, I've shown you all these, all these studies, but we're, we're selling the put every month that even outperforms the um, S&P on, uh, on, on a real basis. There's one covered call index strategy thing that's selling the 3% out of the money covered call monthly, and it actually over like 15 years, it outperforms just buy and hold the S&P and not outperforms on a, on a risk-adjusted basis. It outperforms on that basis too, but it outperforms on an absolute basis. These strategies are proven winners. To be fair to the naysayers, that's not what Defiance is doing. They're doing daily strategies, and I, I don't have a strat. I don't have a white paper I can show you that goes back 15 years on daily strategies. But option strategies in general, selling options in general, gathering the extrinsic premium is a, is a money winning proposition. We, I mean. You know, people know that. Literally, Bernie Madoff, and he'd been selling puts on the SPX, he wouldn't be in jail. The problem was, I think he said he was selling options. I think that was his scam. I think they were supposedly earning an income, or they were probably doing, um, you know, swaps and the stuff that, in, you know, uh, big time people do. Um, but anyway, but they were supposed to be doing that. But, I, but the problem was, it was all bullshit. They, they weren't doing any of it. They just needed new people to come along to pay off the old people. That's what a Ponzi scheme is, and that's not not what this is. The, you know, these guys, there's plenty, they have plenty of opportunity for making money. Yeah, do you maybe think they shouldn't be paying out as much? Maybe they should just pay half of the extrinsic so it's more, 
more sustainable or do you maybe think that they shouldn't pay out anything in a month they lose? Okay, yeah, that's fine. So what that tells me is you don't like the business model. And I get that. The business model, the way they have it, is a little on the risky side. That's why I gave it an 85 and not a 95. I, I mean, I understand that. Um, so, but here's another thing with Ponzi schemes, and this is another thing you get all the time, that about the... Um, about that we just need more people to keep buying to keep these things up. No, ETFs don't, uh, they don't have underwriters like penny stocks do. They don't like issue a jillion shares and the owner of the penny stock company needs to push a bunch of those shares out the door to actually monetize his investment in his company. That's not how ETFs work. They're, they're totally different. They use creation units. Whenever, whenever there's an imbalance, they just print more shares. It doesn't, you know, I mean, that that's the part I don't get. They don't really trade on supply and demand. Tr truly, they don't. Like, I don't believe you could have a short squeeze in an ETF. If there was crazy demand for it, they would just make more creation units. These are more like trading clubs, the way I look at it. I have a lot of experience with options and everything. I don't have a lot of experience with ETFs, especially on this part of the video. If I have this wrong or if there's another way to look at this, please tell me. These are just... These are my thoughts. I'm going to do an in-depth video on creation units and more in-depth video, but I just wanted to get these thoughts down. And I will say this, though. It is important to look at the NAV discounter premium. That's why every fund shows you a chart of the NAV discounter premium. I do know there's times when these funds could trade at a huge discount or a huge, uh, or a huge surplus to NAV. And so that would kind of go against my argument. But when these funds are basically trading for NAV, especially like on Defiance, what they do every day, it's easy to follow. You can put it on a spreadsheet. You can know how much they make to the penny, and you can know how much NAV is worth. It's just total, it's, you know, and there's jillions of people to do it. So I don't see those going to a big discount. It's just like a trading club, in my opinion. Um, but, it, but it's important to keep that in mind, though. Uh, but okay, this is why I'm such a freak for tracking error. When I cover tracking error, that's the whole thing I'm trying to trying to show. I'm trying to get a handle on on the the disconnect between you know what the underlying does and what the high yield fund does. For instance, if I saw Tesla going down five percent and Tesla going down ten percent, I would go crazy. That would not be good. It could do it on a one day basis, maybe. If it does it any more than that, it's a decay or something's wrong. You, you know. But the, what, the way Tesla's been working in practice, and I've been following it every day for months, or Tesla's been working, is when Tesla does go down big, like 20% or something, uh, or Tesla goes down 20%, uh, Tesla goes down 17% or something. It's not great, but it's also not a decayer. It's, it's actually a buffer on both sides, on the upside and the downside. So all it's doing is cutting your volatility. But I would change in a second if I saw something, something like that. Um, by the same token, if I saw Tesla going up 20% and maybe Tesla only going up 1%, that might, might be all right on one or two days. But if I saw something like that consistently where it was just getting none of the upside, no, that would be, that would be bad and I would, I would change my opinion fast. But in reality, what we see is when, you know, over a course of time when Tesla is up 10%, Tesla is up 5% or 6% or something. To me, that's fine. That's within tolerance. Um, but of course these high yielders have extra risk and that, you know, I cover the extra risk nonstop, especially on that tracking air report. That's what I'm looking at. I'm trying to identify any outliers, any extra risk that we don't want, any extra unexpected risk, let's just call it. All right. So, uh, like, comment, and subscribe if you don't mind. I never say that, uh, but I appreciate all you guys. Um, but seriously, let's talk about this now. Use professional advice, not YouTube advice. I really do. I 100% believe everything I say when I say it. Like I say, I'm not one of those people who has to be right or who thinks I always am right. When I get new information, I can adjust my, you know, I can adjust my viewpoint or I have to if I'm being honest with myself. I mean, you, you have to. So, you know, if I get new information based on this video, and I probably will, especially on the part about creation units, I really have no idea what I'm talking about there, just to be honest. But I'm pretty sure these funds don't trade on supply and demand. And there's not, they aren't just using new investors to pay old investors. I'm about 99% sure. But if you guys know something I don't, or if I'm missing something, please let me know on that. Or that goes for anything. But 
but I thought about just nixing that that part of the I thought I almost took that page out of the presentation but I believe it's still important to talk about it if nothing else maybe it'll get a conversation started about it and I'll try to make a better video on creation units and try to actually quantify that um, but just as an example I, and I've said this before the first two weeks I thought defiance was the gold standard then I had to come on and do a video explaining there's my thought and I told everyone I said if you bought defiance I said I'm sorry it's not too late to get out of it and you were up. In fact, anyone that's bought Defiance on the first day is up right now. So, I mean, you know, if it's not what you turned out to be, if, you know, if it's not what you thought to be, even though the nav's down a little bit, the dividends are up more. So, you know, if something I'm saying is making you nervous or something you're hearing from other people, by all means, get out and get J.P. Morgan, you know. I mean, or, you know, or, I mean, you have to, you do you, or go talk to your financial planner. I'm not trying to twist anyone's arm. Um, but anyway, <laughs> the reason I mentioned this again, that's the second time I mentioned this. That's an example of why you don't get advice off YouTube. Wonder if someone would have followed my advice and bought Defiance, and then two weeks later I'm tell I'm saying JP Morgan's a gold standard. Don't get advice off YouTube. Like I always say, it's a great place to do research. And you know, and I and I love to help help you do research and, I, and I'm here for you and everything like that but go to your own financial planner and verify all the stuff that you that you hear from me and that you hear from other people but I'm not BSing I really do feel a hundred percent the way I feel and I'm and I think I'm qualified to say it and I think I especially on the options strategy part of it and I really do feel that way I'm, I'm not blowing smoke I'm not sponsored by defiance all right but this is all about entertainment and education, and I feel I'm doing a good job at offering entertainment and education, um, especially the education part. So if you feel the same way, like I say, if you don't mind, uh, you know, uh, hit the thumbs up or tell somebody else about it, whatever. That would be awesome. I really appreciate that. All right, guys, this has been fun. A little bit of a crazy video, but it's been fun. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Thank you very much.